moments never last, yet there's always one present. Listen, there's a philosopher named Henry Bergson, late 1800s, French guy. He distinguished between two types of memory. Memory type 1 records the events of our daily lives as they occur in time, assigning a place and a date to each event on our personal timelines. When we want to recall these past moments, we imagine it in our minds. This imagining or imaging of that event, the re reconstruction of those recorded images in our mind, is what Bergson calls the intellectual recognition of a perception that has already been experienced. I said, can I help you, miss? Dina Lumari blinks at the bellhop standing before her. How long had she been standing there? Better yet, how had she gotten there? One moment she was sitting in the driver's seat of her car in the parking lot. Now she stands at the lobby doors of the Walton Hotel. She remembers looking at the clock on her dashboard, noting that it was 11.55 a.m. as she turned off the ignition, feeling anxious about missing even a second of the lecture, and then blank. She cannot remember getting out of the car, grabbing her purse, which she now gripped tightly in her fist, walking through the lot, or arriving here. Oh, I am, um, I'm, I'm here for the convention. Memory type two is mechanical. We employ mechanical memory with every movement we make in our repetitive actions in every moment. Remembering to breathe without being conscious of the need. Knowing how to put one foot in front of the other when we walk without having to think about that process as we walk. Reading words without needing to recall learning how to read, that sort of thing. This type, I call it the integrated memory, is dynamic because this memory type is constantly in a process of creation at the same time as it's being utilized. Our bodies are taking in new information from the environment every moment and crystallizing it into memory. The body then uses the memories in a feedback loop, much like a cassette tape to move us into the so-called future. All of this action occurs before we are even conscious of it in thought. Based upon these essential theories, I submit to you Dina moves muse further about the blank spot as she moves through the near-deserted lobby, hotel lobby, past the concierge, into the ballroom, and up to the registration table. A pimply-faced, plump, and bespectacled man-child sits behind the table, <laughs> dozing uncomfortably in a metal folding chair. Her, <coughs> excuse me, jolts him out of the dreamy world. Registration for PsyCon, please, she says, feeling a touch impatient. You're here for PsyCon? He asks with barely disguised sarcasm. His flat gray eyes probe her freshly twisted honey dip locks and her rich earth toned skin as if she's alien, signaling a simultaneous intrigue and disgust with her body. Of course, her words slice the air. His questions seem like a mass implication that she somehow doesn't belong here. He sniffs. That'll be 30 bucks. Hmm. I'm prepaid, Dina Lumari. Dina holds out her hand and receives the name tag that he picks out of a stack nearby, but it's as if her hand is clear as water and he completely ignores it pushing a name tag across the table toward her. A split-second decision arrives now on whether to probe him about his incivility or whether to keep it moving. She glances at her watch, feels her heart synchronized to the tick of the minute hand as it drops onto 11.58 a.m. Lucky for him, the watch has chosen her path. It's time to go. Besides, she was sure she would run into him again later. What room is the PTSD presentation, she asks, but before he can answer, really, before the question even spills out of her mouth, the room materializes into her mind's eye in exact detail, the room number on the plaque next to the door, the people seated around the tables, a large object humped like a mountain beneath a black sheet casting a deep shadow over the front of the room. And though she has never been to this hotel before, she feels sure that she knows exactly where the room is and how to get to it before the rude registrant can even lift a finger to point towards the elevator. She is uneasy about how certain she is of the location, however, as if the knowledge is not hers to possess. The images of the room in her head are a patched up snag in the fabric of her memory, like the memory wasn't there from something she herself experienced, but was instead stitched in. As she walked towards the elevator, every step she takes drops familiar like a dragon deja vu. Along with the few seconds she apparently lost getting from the parking lot to the hotel, each passing minute is becoming more and more peculiar. She wonders if she isn't coming down with something. The presentation is beginning as Dina slinks into the room. The small crowd is spread out around the tables, just as she saw in her mind, hushed as Dr. Shake Hammond stands at the front of the room explaining the methodology of his research and the engineering of the PTSD. Based upon these essential theories, I submit to you that the psychotemporal transcranial stimulation device is the world's first functional time machine. The crowd gasps and bustles. <laughs> Even after discovery of faster than light neutrinos and the confirmation of the Higgs boson particle, talk of time travel still, still belongs in a realm of the cautiously possible but not yet probable. One of the audience members said just as much. That's ridiculous. Time travel isn't possible. And I will argue.
argue with you that it is possible, sir. Einstein's equations work just as well in whichever direction time is flowing. The same equations that describe matter plunging to its death into a singularity at the center of a black hole can be flipped to describe matter exploding from a singularity and spreading out through space-time to birth a universe. It's beautiful. It's all a feedback loop on the grandest, on the grandest scale. Just allow me to explain how it works, Dr. Hammond appealed, holding his hands up to tame the crowd. All of Dr. Hammond's published papers on PTSD. The key behind it is collective memory. For years, Hammond collected the information from various databases on people and experiences. Pictures, birth dates, stories, videos, diaries, statistics, social networking profiles, you name it. He then built a machine that stimulates a virtual scene in the brain based upon memory recall of the person in the machine with the collected data selected by algorithms to fill in the gaps in perception or memory blind spots. The algorithms were as simple as the ones used by companies like Netflix to recommend movies to watch based on the subscriber's preferences. Still, she had her doubts about the machine's capabilities and said so. Clinical trials on 100 participants had produced varying results with major side effects such as dizziness, anxiety, hallucinations, headache, paranoia, cognitive changes, and temporal distortion. <laughs> You've done your homework, Ms. Lamar. Very good. Many of the trial runs were inconclusive, but I assure you that it works and achieves a level of contact with reality that a virtual reality game could never touch. The temporal dist distortions are quite the point. The best way I can describe it is that it's like peeking behind a curtain of your own consciousness, mid-thought, and discovering the wizard, which is you. Your eye becomes turned upon itself, and you, upon itself and you stand both outside and inside yourself. It's a chance to observe the feedback loop that keeps your conscious awareness functioning as it's functioning. The PTSD gives you the chance to watch the play you're starring in from the audience as you simultaneously play your role on stage. Now, think of each scene in the play as a slice of time. So the world's first uh, functional time machine looks a lot like a high-tech version of the race car driving games found in malls across America. Dr. Hammond drops the curtain under which the PTSD is hidden to reveal a seat attached to a monitor and a helmet connected to the machine via a coiled wire. Below the monitor is a console with a number of unlabeled buttons spread out on its dashboard. On either side of the seat is an armrest with cuffs attached, resembling the blood pressure cuffs used in doctor's offices. The traveler would put the helmet on and be led into a semi-hypnotic state with their heartbeat slowed to match a softly beeping timer. Dr. Hammond would then proceed to guide the traveler through a lucid memory. Dr. Hammond explains to the crowd that the first model of the PTSD only allows the traveler to functionally read with their own memories, and only memories as recent as a few minutes or hours prior. He has big plans for the second model, however. Determinism does not defeat free will. They coexist like the wave-particle duality of light or the liquid-solid nature of black holes. It depends upon the observer, all of it. Unless you act consciously, the next moment will be determined by your integrated memory. So you can either act consciously to create the next moment, or you will act automatically and allow stored, integrated memory to determine your next action. But you didn't just come here for talk with people. Today's presentation is the PTSD's first public show and tell. Per the terms of the authorization that you signed when regis registering for my workshop, I have fed the PTSD data of each pre-registered audience member. It has recorded each of you walking into the building as well as other data. So who wants to go first? <laughs> Rena sits down in the seat in front of the console and slides the helmet on, a live feed of the hotel lobby flashing up on the monitor before her. She relaxes in the chair as instructed, reclining slightly, pulse slowing, the room around her fading into shadow. Above her, Dr. Hammond's words fall softly on her ears like snowflakes. Let's start off by recalling the moment right before this one. The scene on the monitor becomes blurry with light, drowning her retinas, then immediately sharpens back into focus. As she's lulling off, she realizes that the scene on the monitor is playing in reverse. A clock in the corner of the screen counts backwards from 12.07 p.m. Now, in a quick succession of mental flashes, Dina, visualize the moment you open your eyes to wake, awaken up to this very moment. Before she plunges into an inky black, Dina sees herself on a monitor moving backwards through the lobby. Remember, time flows differently for each of us, friends. Different strokes for different folks, or as Einstein would put it, different rates for each person's perception. So while it's in its current phase, the PTSD only allows you to remotely observe your actions while including the physical sensations of being a part of the memory. You are given the power of a doubly reflective consciousness, being able to observe your actions as you act without time delay. In future models of the PTSD, I foresee the ability to influence the environment, thus influencing the action. And some of you will continue to scream at these bloody paradoxes, and I will continue to feature logic with just one word, intention. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be late, Dina thought, reading the clock on the dashboard, 11.55 a.m. Thankfully, she was prepaid. 
As she leaned over to grab her purse from the passenger seat, she became paralyzed by a curious sight outside the car window. She sat there in her seat, watching herself walk through the parking lot a few feet ahead of the car, as if she were being tugged by an invisible string. Something was terribly wrong. That's it. Yeah! <laughs>